So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He made us a kingdom of priests. But as a kingdom of priests, what has he made us capable of doing? He's made us capable of offering sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Here's the awesome reality. Christ is worthy of worship because he's God. Christ is worthy of worship because of who he is. He is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of earth. He's worthy of worship because of that. He's also worship, worthy of worship because of what he's done. He loved us. He freed us from our sins by his blood. But Christ makes us worthy to worship. Because apart from us being this kingdom of priests, there is nothing that we can offer to God that is acceptable. And for a generation, we have not only failed to communicate this reality, but we have operated in direct opposition to it. For a generation, we have taught in our seminaries and practiced in our churches this idea of designing worship experiences for people who cannot offer acceptable worship. Seeker driven. Completely ignoring the fact that according to Romans 10, there's no such thing. Amen, somebody. My Bible says there's none who seek God, amen? If I want to do a secret service, it's going to be a John 4 secret service. John 4 says, God's seeking. Amen? He's seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. That's the only seeker there is. So if you want to talk about a God-centered service, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm with you. You want to talk a lost person-centered worship, you're barking up the wrong tree. Because it is only through the redemption that we find in Christ that we are able to offer anything to God at all. Understanding this changes our approach to worship. When we wrap our heads around this reality or realities like this, it changes what happens when we sit down and think about tomorrow's service, amen? And I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm, a, I'm just gonna go on and confess. I was raised, trained, mentored, came to faith, you know, first time I heard the gospel, I was in college. But, but from then on, everything that I was taught, all of my training was centered around this man-centered approach to worship, the affective principle of worship. And I have been in meetings where the discussions centered around the cathartic experience. And an amazing thing happens when you em embrace 
a reformed epistemology not just a reformed soteriology but a reformed epistemology and amazing things happen that thing happens when you sit down and think about what we are going to put before people and when that becomes centered around the great truths that we've been commanded to communicate it changes things again Notice that this has nothing to do with how old or how new a song is. I couldn't care less. Amen? There's some old stuff that's rotten to the core. Amen, somebody. That's not the issue. When we make that our issue, we demonstrate that we've completely missed the point. The issue is, here are some truths that our worship ought to be designed to communicate and to reiterate again and again and again. Are we communicating that? Are we reiterating that? And instead of asking the question, are the people going to come to that moment? We need to ask the question, is God going to be rightly exalted? Because there does not have to be a choice between that which exalts God and that which excites us. Amen?